Hello and welcome to the talk Expander Graphs are Non-Malleable Codes. My name is Peter Rasmussen and this is joint work with Amit Sahai from UCLA. We're so lucky in this talk that the title of the talk is almost exactly the main theorem as well. So the main theorem states that any deregular graph on n vertices with spectral expansion lambda satisfying that there are sufficiently many vertices yields uh, lambda to the three halves by D non-malleable code for single bit messages in the split state model. So there's a bit to unpack in this theorem and that's what we will start out by doing. We're going to discuss spectral expansion, non-malleable codes, the split state model, and later you will also learn how to turn a graph into a code. All right, so this is the overview. There are the preliminaries. We'll do some context of the results. Then we'll look at a proof of the main theorem. And then in the end, we'll discuss future work. All right, so let's dive into codes. Um, so a coding theory is basically about sending a message from some space across a channel controlled by an adversary. And the idea is that the adversary applies some function f uh, from a class of functions to the message. Um, and we don't really do it directly like this usually. So instead what we do is we actually encode the message in some other space and then we let the adversary apply their um, tampering to the um, encoded message instead. And then we decode. And we hope that this encoding helps uh, preserve the integrity of the message against the adversarial attack. So um, we can then discuss what does integrity mean? So how do we want the message to be preserved? And furthermore, which attacks are the adversary allowed to launch? The classical example is that of error correcting codes. In error correcting codes, the adversary is fairly weak. He can only uh, change a fraction of the bits of the encoded message. Um, and this means that we get very strong guarantees. Actually, we can guarantee that we preserve the message exactly. And um, we get all sorts of nice stuff, like the encoding is not very long and, and so on. Um, but this is for a weak adversary. Uh, then Simbowski uh, et al. in 2010 asked what happens if we have a much more general class of adversaries. Um, that's much stronger. And the, um, the integrity criterion they came up with is called non-malleability or no message tampering. So what do we mean by this? Well, uh, what we mean is that there's no meaningful uh, tampering with, with the message um, in the sense that um, we say that the following uh, tampering is trivial. So if you copy the message, then that's, that's pretty trivial. If you change the message to some constant message, that's also I mean, fair game. And finally, you can scramble up the message so that it doesn't make any sense anymore. So um, the idea is that um, to, to formally uh, present this, um, we ask that the tampering experiment, so the experiment where you take some message, you encode it, and uh, you apply the tampering function f, and then you decode. So this is the tampering experiment. Well, uh, this is should be epsilon close in statistical distance to just a combination of these copy, um, constant, or scramble operations, and that the, the distribution on the right is independent of the message. All right. And then we say that um, the encoding scheme, the coding scheme is epsilon non-malleable with respect to the class of functions that f belongs to, if this is true for all f. OK, so uh, the model that we're working in is the split state model, which was also um, introduced in uh, the paper by Zembowski et al. In 10. And uh, so the coding scheme here uh, encodes the message as two separate code words, a left code word and a right code word. And the adversary is then allowed to tamper each message individually. Uh, so uh, pictorially, we have a message M that we encode in two separate parts. They are then 
um, tampered with independently and finally we then decode so this is the model and the first construction of this was where the message was only one bit and furthermore where uh, no encoded message could decode to a but so all encodings made sense in a sense okay so there's this very nice characterization of this that was introduced by Symbolsky, Kasana, and Obremsky in 2013 when they constructed this first split-state non-malleable code. Uh, and essentially, the characterization is that um, this coding scheme is epsilon non-malleable if and only if the adversary cannot flip a uniformly chosen bit with probability more than one half plus epsilon. So of course, it's always possible to flip the bit zero because you can just put the constant function one or the other way around but if you choose the bit at random and then you're asked to flip it without knowing what it is then you shouldn't be able to succeed with probability more than one half plus epsilon all right so that was it for non-malleable codes for now so let's talk a bit about expander graphs so expander graphs are pretty well known in in, in uh, computer science but we'll go through some stuff anyway so uh, if we have a deregular graph G on uh, n vertices and uh, we look at the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix of G, then we say that G has spectral expansion lambda if all but the top eigenvalue of uh, the adjacency matrix has absolute value at most lambda. So uh, why is, oh yeah. And typically we have uh, lambda or in, in computer science applications, we can use that lambda is um, about square root d. And for our applications, we need at most that it's little o of d to the 2 thirds. So we're good there. Um, so the reason that this is so, so useful, or one reason at least, is the expander mixing lemma. So the expander mixing lemma says something about if you have two subsets of vertices of a graph g, and then you look at the um, edges between these subsets, then they don't uh, deviate too much from what could be construed to be their mean, right? So um, if G was a random D regular graph, then you would expect there to be D times the size of A times the size of B divided by N uh, vertices. So that's this term or edges, sorry, between uh, the subsets. And so, this is exactly the bound is a concentration bound on uh, the deviation from this expectation uh, in terms of, of the spectral expansion. And this is super useful, as you'll see um, in a bit. Now, let's discuss some historical context for, for our main theorem. So first of all, um, non-malleable codes were defined in 2010 by Zembowski Pietzak and Wix, and then it actually took three years before anyone came up with even a one-bit split-state non-malleable code, again by Zimbowski, but this time Kasana and Obremsky, and in 2013. Right. And this construction was based on two source extractors and led to uh, a bunch of other work also based on uh, two source extractors. So what we do uh, differently is to base non-malleable codes on expanders. The other non-malleable codes that have been developed are, are, are excellent already. They, have, um, uh, they can encode messages of any length. They have a great rates. Um, but they're all based on two source extractors and, and that, that theory. Um, and so, yeah, we achieved that we base it on expanders. And furthermore, we achieve a very short and elementary proof that um, it is an effect of non-malleable code. Okay, so pictorially, um, we know that two source extractors imply non-malleable codes. Furthermore, roughly speaking, two source extractors are also expanders, uh, but not necessarily the other way around. Um, in a sense, mathematically speaking, expanders are a weaker object. So um, the discovery here is that, in fact, this is enough, at least for one bit non-malleable codes, and this is what we do. Okay, so enough beating around the bush, let's get to the main theorem. And for that, I first need to tell you how to 
uh, use a graph to make a coding scheme. And so this is our candidate code. We take a deregular graph, and then we say that an encoding is a pair of vertices. Remember, we're in a split state model, so we want to a left and a right message. And the way you decode a message, this is the easiest to start with, is you simply ask, are these two vertices, uh, is there an edge between these two vertices? If in that case, you decode to one, otherwise you decode to zero. And the way you encode is by sampling uniformly so if you encode a one, then you uniformly sample an edge. And on the other hand, if you encode a zero, then you want to uniformly sample two vertices with no edge between them. Okay, so we claim that this, as long as G is an expander graph, this is a non-malleable code. Um, and for that, we start by proving the following theorem. So let's split our tampering function F into two functions g and h, uh, each between uh, uh, v and v. And um, recall the theorem of uh, Zimbowski et al. that said that proving that um, a, co a one bit non malleable code is, in fact, non malleable, is equivalent to showing that you can't flip a bit with probability more than one half plus epsilon. So what we start by showing is that this probability can be written exactly as one half plus this big looking big term. And so how do we go about this? Well, it's, it's fairly simple. So you start just looking at the case B equal to one. So if you encode uh, one in the tampering experiment and then you get out zero, that this is the same as the probability of uniformly sampling an edge. And then after you apply G and H, you get a non edge. And uh, you, can exp you can look at this by, by considering all non-edges and then looking at how many, so for each non-edge, consider the pre-image under G and H and ask how many edges are there, there that go to that non-edge. Um, and then you divide by, uh, by DEM because that's how many uh, edges you could choose in the fir in the, from the beginning. Okay, uh, so now there's a little trick that you can partition um, things so that uh, this is also equal to one minus the same sum, but over the edges instead of the non-edges. This is basically the complementary event. All right, so that's for b equals one, then you have b equals zero. Here instead, you want to look at what is the probability that a non-edge is flipped to become an edge uh, under g and h. And this is exactly equal to, so first you choose a uniformly random non-edge, that's uh, this term. And now you consider for every edge, you ask how many non-edges are hitting that edge. Right, so you consider an edge, now you take the pre-image under G and H, and of course all vertex pairs here are candidates, but then you subtract all the ones where there's an edge between. So these are the candidates, you subtract all with an edge between. And putting these two together, manipulating the sums a little bit, um, you get exactly the expression that you were promised. Okay, good. So with this lemma in hand, so let's just sum up what we have. We have the theorem of Zimbowski, Kazan, and Obramski um, saying that um, this is a non-malleable code if and only if you can only flip a bit with probability one half plus epsilon. And we have the lemma that says that this, in our case, this probability is exactly given by one half plus this expression. Thus, our main theorem, which is that if you have a deregular graph uh, with spectral, spectral expansion lambda and n is sufficiently large, we won't go into details with this, but um, we need this for everything to work out, then the coding scheme generated by the graph is a uh, lambda to the three halves over D non-malleable code up to log factors in D. Uh, the actual theorem in the paper, there, is no, there are no log factors, but we simplify a bit for the presentation. Okay, so now by uh, the summing up I just did, this will follow from uh, the following proposition. So basically this says that the, the error term we had in the lemma, one half plus there was some one over D times N minus D, and then times the sum. And basically multiplying over, uh, we get that we, we need this to be true. 
Okay, so let's dive into a proof of this. All right, uh, and the idea behind the proof actually goes in multiple steps. So first, we want to bound away a bunch of these terms just by by sparsity. So because the graph is sparse, um, it can be hard to uh, to hit uh, edges from non-edges and and this uh, eliminates a bunch of terms right in the beginning, as you'll see. Um, then the content of the sum, like each term, is an obvious um, mixing lemma uh, application waiting to happen. So that we will do, and but then we will get some problematic terms. We'll get these error terms, and there will be too many of them. So now the trick is to see that um, the sum is over some edges and it will actually the error terms will be a sum over um, to um, the the edges between two subsets of vertices and thus we can bound the number of terms with another application of the expander mixing lemma and this will will finish the proof so that was that was the overview so let's dive into it so first suppose that we consider uh, the sum where we restrict to edges between pairs of vertices where the pre-image under G of the left vertex is small, less than n over d squared. Okay, so now we can bound this very easily. This sounds complicated, but we can bound this very easily by just we just th throw away the uh, number of edges here, and we just replace this pre-image by n over d squared and we immediately get uh, this expression below and since each uh, u can only occur most, at most uh, d times in the sum uh, this is less than or equal to n because there are a total of n vertices okay so this is uh, good so we could do the same trick if we restrict it to the case where uh, we have a vertex and then at the right vertex of the edge um, has a small um, pre-image under H and uh, this means this is just a symmetrical argument and thus we can actually reduce to the case where none of them have a small pre-image under G or H so yeah as it says by symmetry we re reduce to proving the following uh, thing um, where we just restrict the sum to edges where uh, the vert vertices have large pre-images so to further solve the problem, we need to uh, subdivide uh, these uh, sets. So the way we do this is we just subdiv we partition the G1 and H1 um, individually uh, by their sizes. Um, yeah. So just just read this, uh, and then um, we consider for each K and each L. Uh, we just consider the case where we just restrict to edges between those sets G, G1K and H1L okay um, and so yeah let's go about this so we write this and now we sum a little differently so we sum over the vertices of G1K and for each vertex of G1K we consider all the neighboring vertices so this is what N of V means the neighboring vertices of V that are in H L1. Okay, and so we just sum up each, all those terms, and that, that becomes this expression, which again is just begging to um, have the mixing lemma applied to it. So, doing that, uh, we immediately end up with this much, much nicer expression. And just by the fact that we, we know almost exactly what the, uh, the size of the pre image of of uh, v under g and u under h is we could just uh, pull this out in front and we get get this expression so this is just simply the number of terms in the sum and um, and now what oh here we go now what then we apply uh, the cauchy schwartz to this so to, to the sum at least so if you uh, so we take this as the number of terms in the sum and then if you sum these guys below the square root then you end up with exactly 
the, the edges between G1K and H1L. This is not so surprising if you look at it for a moment. Um, and now we have another application of uh, the expander mixing lemma waiting to happen, since this can't deviate too much from, from its expectation. Right. So this is now we've applied the, the mixing lemma. So we, this is the, the expectation and this is the deviation. And it turns out that this will um, dominate because here we have it divided by n and we have been promised that n is sufficiently large. So, so this term um, dominates and thus we get, get the following, right? So now we furthermore know that these G1K and H1L are fairly small because um, G1K is the set of vertices that have a very large preimage uh, at least of size n divided by 2 to the k under uh, g. And since there are at most n vertices to pick f to choose from, um, that means that, that there can be at most 2 to the k such vertices. And the same thing with h1, uh, h1l. So that means that we get the expression at the bottom. And, um, and since k and l were symmetric in this argument. We didn't need that l was larger than k or the other way around. We may just assume that k is smaller than l and um, or the other way around. If that's the case, then we could have done the reverse um, deduction. And now we get s k l is O of lambda to the 3 halves times n, which was very close to what we wanted. Right. So that means that the sum that we started with that we want to bound, uh, that's smaller than or equal to the sum over uh, uh, k and l smaller than or equal to 4 log d about of skl. And each of these are at most O of lambda to the 3 halves n. So we at most get a log squared uh, d factor on top of that, and the theorem is complete. All right. So Having proven the main theorem, um, let's discuss some future work that we could possibly do. So the idea would essentially be, right, that we would try to base non-malleable codes on expanders and, and see where that led us. Um, and for that, we could look into um, encoding longer messages, introduce leakage. Um, and so like, what is, the, what is the reason for this? The reason would be that we could get very simple non-malleable codes in, in terms of uh, both construction, but also in terms of proof, hopefully. Um, and that this would then ultimately lead to a better understanding of non-malleable codes would be the hope, right? Thanks a lot for watching.